like he, he mentioned, we have a salt pit. Uh, it was dug to about a foot and then sand and soil was layered, so you can kind of see that a little bit. Uh, unfortunately, again, the conditions were not the best, uh, but what we have, it's a um, uh, case uh, 330, Turbo Teal 330, a Salford uh, unit, and then we have a John Deere unit out here that we're hoping to show you some differences out here. Um, again, the conditions were not the best, so we'll, we'll work with that. So let's start with uh, residue management. Why is it important? Well, we know this, that it can impact uh, next year crop um, just from uh, different aspects, different things. We'll talk about these in a little bit more detail. Um, equipment operation, you know, if you have residue piled up in, a, in, a, in an edge or something, you know how it can just mess up with your planting operation, tillage, anything else. Um, the other thing that it's uh, really important is that can affect soil erosion and infiltration. Notice I'm not talking about runoff in here, I'm talking about infiltration, and we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit more detail in a second. And the other thing too is that one of the take on messages I hope that you take with you is that crop residues are a resource. They're not trash, okay? If you think about an average corn crop, I mean, it's not a high yielding one. Uh, it contains 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre, 25 uh, pounds of uh, P205 and 100 pounds of K2O potash. Soybean, similarly, 45, a little bit less, 10 and 35. And the other thing too, it's, you know, there's a lot of interest right now with soil health, soil quality type stuff, provides a lot of organic matter. You know, as plants photosynthesize and capture carbon from the atmosphere, they're gonna be putting that into the ground through the root system and uh, just that biomass on the surface. And if you look at the soil pit in here and throughout the day, especially the one from NRCS, um, uh, he's gonna be talking about that. You can see the biopores that are formed either by biological activity that are, you know, really promoted by soil organic matter and the root channels. And you can see how our organic matter gets into the profile and helps uh, with uh, soil hydraulic properties and fertility and all these kind of things. Uh, here's some data. This is actually a little bit, little bit west of us from Nebraska, but uh, just wanted to show you this quick, share with this, but uh, talking about residue. Uh, we had a four year study and they were looking at corn and soybean yield. And so what this guy did, so we have yield up here on the vertical, and then we have residue amount on the horizontal. So what they did is that they have four levels of residue. One where it is zero, where they took all the residue out. Then they have one that they left only half of it, 50%. One where they left all of it, 100%. Another one where they actually took the 50 from here, put it on top of the 100, so they had 150, right? And so what you can see in these four years, there were some years, there were no differences, right? In other years, uh, there was some, some difference, and the, the, the difference was that there was an increasing trend in yield with increasing amount of uh, residue on the surface. Now, having said that, though, it's a little bit different conditions here, climatic conditions, but it's shown the benefit. These guys were able to attribute this, these increases on those years that they measured those increases to two factors. 80% of that was attributed to two factors. Anybody care to guess what those two might be? More sure. And temperature. So yes, temperature, when you have a lot of residue early in the season, will delay your emergence. But later on, if you have a hot and dry summer, it's actually going to help keep those canopy temperatures low or lower. And it hel helps with um, evapotranspiration. It makes the plant a little bit uh, better at evapotranspiration. Now, having said that, though, a lot of times we see data like this. Um, this is actually from uh, some experiments uh, that I'm conducting at three locations around Wisconsin. And we have two tillage systems. We have a no-till system and we have a conventional. That's a, uh, a fall chisel and a sole fi finisher in the, in the spring falling. Uh, yeah, fall chisel, I said, right? And this is just 2013. This site has been in place for uh, this, this 2013 was the fourth cropping year on that one. We expanded that uh, to these other two locations. So this is the first year for these two locations. Marshfield, uh, this name says it all, Marsh Field. It's actually a location that is really wet, has a lot of drainage issues. Uh, so that basically you can see the yields were, were pretty, pretty, pretty poor and no difference in the tillage. Now, if we look at the other two locations in Arlington, those are some prime silt loam soils in Wisconsin, uh, pretty high yielding, significant difference where the no-till was actually lower than the conventional system. Similarly, Lancaster is actually in the Southwest region of the state. So this is the drift lifts, right? Uh, soils that are prone to erosion. Same, same trend, no-till, 
significantly lower than, than uh, your conventional, okay? And I'll, I'll say you a little bit more about that. The other thing we're doing is we're actually looking at root strength. And so what we're doing is that we, we come with this contraption that we attach to a corn stalk, and then we measure how much force it takes to pull it out of the ground. So that gives us an indirect measurement of the health of the root, I guess, how, how good the root system is. Conventional, no tillage, uh, three locations. Marshall, again, no difference. We look at Arlington and Lancaster, a little bit more uh, force required to pull those roots on the no-till system. That could be two things. That could be that that soil is a little bit denser, and that also could be that the root system is a little bit uh, healthier, I guess, or more aggressive, or a combination of those two, okay? Now, let me talk about this differences here real quick. It drives to the point, I think. So part of this issue, and we see these a lot, uh, at least uh, some of the work I've been involved with, has to do with equipment setup. That's my theory. So the planter we're using here is just a four row planter uh, from the 90s. And we do have some row cleaners and all that kind of stuff, but it's not optimized for no-till. It's the same planter we're using here. And it's the same planter we use for most of our other uh, experiments. We just have the one planter, uh, at least in my group. And so this is the difference we're seeing. So my take home here is that equipment setup, it is really, really, really important to make your system work. Whatever system you're doing, get out of the cab, look at what you're working on, look how it's set up, look how it's running, okay? That has, you know, applies to a no-till system, that applies to a conventional system, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm blaming this to our no-till uh, setup on our planner. Protecting the soil, baldness is bad, right? Is it? All right. So for soil, this being studied and it's well known, about 30%, and it depends on your soil, your conditions, your slope, and all this stuff. So this rule of thumb only, just about 30% of residue on your soil surface cuts about 50% of your erosion. You're not cutting it to zero, which it's almost impossible, very hard to cut it to zero, but we know that about 30% and higher, that's what we start calling conservation system because we know it actually helps uh, keep that soil on, on the ground in your, in your fields. Uh, and then higher, and this is just a, a picture is depicting that the corn uh, residue and soybean residue, what it looks like. Everybody knows how to me measure residue in your operation. If you're setting up something and you want to see how much residue you're leaving behind, does everybody know how to do that? Pretty easy. You can get a, I'm going to use this sort of illustration, but you can get a tape measure. You want to lay it diagonally across your rows, right? And then you're going to go on every, do it about 10 feet, right? And you're gonna go on every foot mark. And if there's a piece of residue, I always do it on the same side of the tape. So if you have a piece of residue at the 12th mark, let's say, at the one foot, you count that as a one. At the two foot, if you don't have anything, count as a zero. So you add your ones anytime you have a piece of residue. You can count manure, you can count residue, right? You cannot count rocks, okay? Those don't count, <laughs> all right? And then what you do, if you do 10 feet, multiply that by 10, I give you the percentage residue cover. Pretty easy. Do that several times across your field, zigzag it, and, uh, and got, you got your residue count. The three steps of erosion, detachment of the particle, raindrop hits with pretty high intensity, detaches the particles, then they get transported and they, they get deposited either in another place of your field, on the ditch. You want to stop it right here before it detaches. You want to leave it where it is. That's where residue um, uh, comes into play. Uh, I won't talk much about the universal soil loss equation here because we don't have a whole bunch of time, but and here's just an example of uh, solar ocean. This is actually from Minnesota. Uh, this is a picture of the field. Uh, they looked at carbonate kind of to get an idea on how much of the soil. So they're looking at the profile using carbonate to kind of figure out how much of the, of the topsoil was eroded. So basically the amount of carbonate as it goes up, that means the subsoil carbonates are exposed. And this is a, a normalized yield over several years with different crops. And it basically shows that on those road areas, they're about 50% of the maximum yield. So big, big impact. So why, why you should think it matters for your operation? It decreases your yield. Another thing that happen, that's happening, not only are you losing all your nutrients when that, that topsoil gets uh, eroded away, but the depth of your uh, profile where you're storing water for your plants, your plant level water gets diminished, right? So the, lower, the less water you have in your profile, less happy your plants are going to be. So here's an example. If you want to kind of estimate, you know, this is what I'm thinking of doing and maybe thinking, well, you know what, I might want to change 
the setup or, or you know what I'm doing, my operations, how much resin am I leaving on the ground. So this is just kind of an example. So here on the top is basically just some example operations that that uh, that I have listed here, and then residue from corn, residue from soybean, and this is percent, uh, but divided by 100, so it's just a fraction percent. So after harvest on corn, you usually have about 90 to 95 percent residue left. Soybean about 80 to 90. That shows you the nature of the of the residues. It's different, right? Uh, after winter decomposition, you'll have about 80 to 90 with corn, 70 to 80. Again, these are just kind of uh, guidelines. They're not the law, I guess, if you will. Mold board, two to seven. Uh, chisel or twisted chinks, 40 to 50, so on and so forth. The other point is, anytime, like I say, anytime you do a, uh, an operation in the field and you put equipment down there, it's gonna affect the amount of residue. You, you know, you're working the soil, uh, even with a planter, okay? And that's usually what we do with no-till. We're trying to do a one-pass operation where we have the planter set up for um, <clears throat> doing the tillage, essentially. So here's an example on a conventional system uh, with corn, harvest. I'm actually using just the high high uh, range of for, for uh, simplicity times 100. So we start with 100%, right? After that, we have 95% left. So I'll take that. I did a full chiseling. So 95% or that 95 times 60, which came, uh, where's my full chisel? I use the one with the straight chanks. So 60, right? 57% left after that. Then some winter decomposition. So I take that 57 times the 90 from the winter decomposition. Uh, spring disc, so on and so forth, 36. Planner, then I do a field cultivation. So I have a 29%. So fairly typical, at least in Wisconsin. Uh, pretty close to that 30%, but remember I was using the high range on these. So something to think about, you know, this might help you to kind of figure out, well, you know what, I might want to change this or change that and, you know, look at what might be left in your field. So kind of a, a simple way, back of the envelope type calculation that you can do to look at that kind of stuff. This is a similar uh, setup. Uh, we're looking at phosphorus and uh, conventional tillage, no-till again, the no-till, that certification. So depending if you're having uh, where your uh, sufficiency index for phosphorus land, that might mean you might have to sample a little bit different uh, compared to a conventional system, right? You might have to do a zero to two and then four to six and, and see if you have that, that, that problem. Uh, in a conventional system, that's a little bit more straightforward to, to do that with because you have that incorporation in there. Uh, Got a little spike in here. Anybody? Maybe venture to guess what happened in here. That's uh oh about three inches away from the row. Fertilizer band. That's right. That's my my, my guess too. So great minds think alike, right? <laughs> um, now, <clears throat> having said that, though, if we look at uh, loss of phosphorus, this is an average over several years. Uh, Moldboard plow, no-till, chisel plow, and ridge till, obviously the higher the disturbance, the higher chance of losing phosphorus out of your field. Uh, and this is actually in runoff erosion. So, uh, But you can still have some tillage system that don't lose a whole bunch of it. This is a no-till, chisel plow, and a ridge till. So, so it's, it's about thinking about you know, what you're doing out there and managing your, your tillage properly. Uh, Fertilizer incorporation, you know, you guys might have heard about this, the four R's. I think you're going to hear more about it next door. Um, but this is about placement. A two-by-two two band for uh, phosphorus is actually recommended just because it can be bound to the soil rather quickly. So if you do a broadcast, that uh, phosphorus is not going to be as available. If you band it close to your root system, it's going to have less of a chance because it's concentrated to bound, bind to the soil and it'll be more available to your plant. So that's this is why... Uh, we recommend this. And next bit, they'll they'll talk about this. And here's an example talking about that. We're looking at a broadcast bandit. Nothing applied. So this is the control. Uh, when you broadcast, uh, four percent above control, eighty pounds per acre. When you just band forty pounds, you get a ten percent increase. Uh, when you do eighty percent broadcast and forty bandit, uh, eleven percent. So just that 40, 40 pounds in the band, highly effective. Really no different to that, okay? So like I said, we have three different pieces of equipment here, very different, and we're not really here to compare them like I stated, um, but we're just trying to look at their action. So if you look at the profile here and you look at the layering, um, 
you can see that there was very little disturbance of these layers, right? You guys can see that all the way across. Uh, those are orange stakes are actually showing the bottom of the sand layer, right? Um, <clears throat> so I went out and measured how deep these tools were going in the soil, not in, not in the pit, because this is just sandy. Uh, so obviously the density of this was lower, right? And so they actually all went about three inches, three and a half, so not very deep. So think about how these soil conditions were. Fairly compact because we had equipment going back and forth. We had an excavator out here. We had bobcats. We had uh, tractors, all that kind of stuff coming out here. So this was very compacted. Some compaction over here, right? Now we're going through this area that it's it's fairly loose. How long are these implements? Fairly long, right? So as they're floating across from here, it's basically they were being held up. So unfortunately, because of the soil conditions, we didn't get a lot of action like we want it uh, in, the, in, the, in the pit. I did see, you know, here maybe there was a little bit of, of uh, vertical action right here. So, you know, vertical till, that's the purpose of it, uh, to do some vertical uh, interaction, uh, action. Same thing with the Salford. I had seen one earlier and, and I did fail to mark it. Um, yeah, right over here, thank you. So same thing with the Salford, you know, doing that, that vertical shattering. With the Southford, I think it's very interesting. It's being trampled a little bit, but if you had a chance to go back there, you can see where every of those uh, wavy coulters landed. And, you know, and they got a really nice pacing. They do a really good job on shattering that soil. You know, that's things. You know, soil was so sticky and so hard that you know it, it kind of left like a clay imprint, if you will, in there. Now, a very different uh, a piece of equipment uh, with the John Deere here. Uh, basically. Uh, cultivator type uh, piece of equipment did a good job at what it's supposed to do, you know, cultivate, uh, churn up that soil a little bit more, uh, not going very deep again, but four inches or so. Uh, one thing that is different to the vertical tilt implements is that uh, a cultivator will actually drag some of the soil a lot more. This way you can see where I have that those orange stakes and that's kind of a rough estimate, but probably a couple of feet some of that sand got transported. We had a little bit of sand here so that's not really fair, um, but you know, that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to break, you know, have any weeds out there, what have not supposed to do that. So another comment I want to make too about um, residue incorporation that I failed to mention. So if you have your soil profile, I'm not a very good artist, so bear with me. You have a soil profile and you have, bless you, and you have, um, residue here, what, what you want with that residue is actually to be kind of like so, or on the soil surface, as opposed to being completely buried in the ground. The reason for that being is that when you get a rainfall event, right and water starts getting on the soil <clears throat> these uh, pieces of residue that are in, in the ground are going to basically act like a wick so water is actually going to come and flow through there and it's going to help that water infiltrate into the profile and that that's with any type of residue not just corn but it could be wheat it could be soybean anything else soybean for the most part you know i'm inclined to leave it alone now if you have residue that's laying completely buried, I mean this will happen, but you want to minimize the amount of that berry, so you want to have some stuff showing on the surface, right? Water is going to infiltrate into the profile, it's going to hit that residue, and basically that, that if you think about it, that's going to form a little pocket in the profile. That's going to impede water flow, right? So for that water to go through that residue, it has to saturate the above portion of that soil profile. So guess what's happening? You're starting to have ponding over here, so your risk for erosion is starting to go up too right? And that water is not going, and then it's going to run off, it's not going to your profile where you want it for your crops, right? A good crop of corn soybean needs about how many inches of water a year? 24, right? A good deep soil profile, you know, if you're thinking about corn, how much water do you think it'll hold? About 10 to 12 inches, fully recharged. So you start a spring, if it's fully recharged, you have 10 to 12. You're missing about half of your water, if not more. So you want to make sure that all that rainfall that you get during the growing season counts, right? 
So you want that water to go into the profile and recharge that soil profile. So essentially you want that water to go in and go in, not find a, an area where it's impeded the flow um, and, and, if, and, and impacts how much water goes deep into the profile, okay? So that's another comment I wanted to make about um, residue. Any other questions or comments? How does it affect germination? Okay, germination. Residue? Yeah, so the, the interaction with residue and germination is actually going to be mainly, um, mainly related to uh, temperature, the soil temperature. So we know with these dark soils, you would like to have a little bit of that soil exposed so that soil warms up quick, right? So on a no-till scenario, that's what I was talking about in my case, that no-till is not, up the, the, the planter I'm using is not, it's not optimized uh, for no-till because it's not opening, in my opinion, a big enough swath to let that soil warm up. So if you have your soil completely covered with residue, it's gonna take it longer to, to, uh, to warm up. And in some cases, maybe even dry it up a little bit if you have drainage issues and you, you don't have a uh, tile drain. Amounts of residue, uh, yeah, to a point, uh, the, the main thing would be to make sure that you take some of that residue away, but it's mainly gonna be uh, two factors, your soil type and the moisture at which you're planting. And then obviously the setup on, on, your, on your planter is gonna be critical for that. But as long as you move some of that residue away, should be fairly even then. Now the setup of the planter, if you have more residue, you know, that's gonna affect, you know, your depth and all that kind of stuff, you know, just because how your equipment's traveling through the ground. <laughs>